Thank you, Lillian and Alan. And thank you, the other Alan in Canada. I'm so grateful that we have this one year anniversary of serving together. And I was counting all the series of courses I've taught and teaching through the end of this year during COVID. It's a total of 10. They range from six weeks to 13 week duration. And CCI offer five of those 10 courses. So I'm so glad that we can um, serve together to bless our community, to help people. So today I come to you to share one of my dream topic. I always love to help people with interviews because I've learned and made mistakes from my own interview. And I've interviewed hundreds of people over the years, whether people applying to our company at AT&T or people applying to Cornell and Princeton, high school students. I also help a lot of people with mock interview, helping them prepare for a job and college interview. So I'm very passionate. And both from my own experience and also from researching and learning from other people. So I come to you today to share from a wide range of experience and research. And I hope that uh, you're ready and put up your seatbelt because we're gonna have a packed 70 minutes learning a lot of basic principle and many tools and examples and use cases. So let's get ready. Very briefly, a minute about my own background. I was born in Hong Kong, growing up in a very poor family. We were homeless at one point and I was a troublemaker, may not look like it now, but certainly a troublemaker and we were living on the edge. At my last year in high school, as a teenager, we immigrated to Maryland. And that year, I became a Christian, and my life was changed to be a peacemaker. And we actually came as refugees, so our family's been very poor in our financials. We couldn't even afford elementary school tuition. So it's been a series of miracles that I got into Cornell and then Princeton, did my undergraduate and graduate study in engineering, and then I worked for at and for 33 years, 28 years were in New Jersey and five years in our headquarter in Dallas. And now we're in San Diego, blessings from sunny San Diego. We've been here for three and a half years, living the American dream, uh, retired or refired. So I'm actually busier than before because I do give 20 some talks a month and also do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people, uh, 20 people per month or so. So today we're gonna to learn about how to build your personal brand and how do you communicate it? So this is our kickoff talk before we launch into the career footprint series. So I'm very excited that we can offer this course. First time that we are doing it for whole family. So I've taught this many times in English and in Mandarin. Some are on our website, call to work website and I'll share the resource later. So it's the first time that we offer this for family, so we already have about 60 people registered, families who have as many as five people joining. So it's very exciting because we're gonna to learn together how to revamp and refine our career footprint, how to get to know ourselves, get to know others and let others get to know us. So that's the four weeks in August and we'll come back to this later on. So, when we uh, finish today's talk, we'll share some next steps and you see what we're gonna share today have many hooks into the next four weeks workshop because you need to know the five W of work, why, who, what, when, where. And you need to know the five P model. I give you an example of a teenager who worked on his, her five, e, five P model. And you need to know your five no. How do you know God's will, when, where, what to work on? And know the five P, know yourself, know others, networking, building meaningful relationship, and be known by others. Part of what we covered today. How would you be known by others? Your personal brand, through your interview, through your communication. So there are many tools that we'll share in these series of classes. So here's an example of a five P for a ninth grader. Now she's going on to 10th grade. She's a very positive and eager to learn um, 
good example of a student. So just spending less than an hour one-on-one -on -one with the student. She quickly came up with this 5P and we won't go into detail and we'll do that in the four week class. And through going through this 5P model and understanding yourself. And when you do it as a family, it's a lot of fun because many of the tools that I share, I know some adults would use it in their family and they came back and share. What a big difference when they can do it as a family because they get to know each other they listen to each other's perspective, build really positive relationship. So through this 5P, this freshman in high school got to know her purpose, principle, passion, people, and performance. And you can see in her performance, she's very specific in year 2021, how she's going to do good work toward the purpose, the vision that she has and very specific on number of honor courses, the grade and coping strategy, and how frequently she'll read the Bible. So this is what we usually call the SMART goal, that your performance is achieving the SMART goals driven by your purpose. So this is really exciting. When she get to know all these five P, and she just did a one-on-one -on -one with me this week. Um, she also did a 10-year plan and look at what would she be like when she's 25, she's 15 now. So 10 years later, as a young adult, what would her 5P be? So much of them may remain the same. Those in color would be more unique as a young adult, like the, those in Burgundy. So this week she told me she's leaning more toward business. And that's encouraging to know a young person like her monitor and tune to her own interests and figure out what she's more interested in. And in fact, she's starting a nonprofit project, very creative idea that she has. And then she has a group of mentors, a professor giving her advice. So she's a very proactive student. So that's an example of 5P and that's what we'll go through in our four week class. So to start off thinking about interviews and I know I'm speaking to a combination of young adults, older adults, or near retirees, or teenagers. So it could be looking for a job, or could be applying for college. So think of your interviewer as companies, employers, or universities, admissions office, or alumni like myself, that I would interview you as a, a college applicant. What would we be looking for? So if you look at this list of 12, you can see enthusiasm, positive attitude, willingness to learn, curious, self-starter, motivated like the mentee I just talked about, proactive problem solver, work well with team, strong work ethic, well-rounded personality, desire to contribute, volunteer, basic math skill, and literate reading and writing. If you look at these 12 basic qualities that employers and universities may look for, you are surprised to see that only two are really hard skill, which is the math and literature. Everything else is what we call soft skill. So to start off, remember when you go to school, when you go to work, it isn't just the grade that you are working hard to get. It isn't just the projects that you work hard to get done. I learned from my decades of experience studying and working in my in corporate America. It's also the soft skill. In fact, they are more important. The people relationship. When you have good relationship, you would get things done much faster and easier. And when you build good relationship in the right way, that's going to take you a long way. So today we're gonna to focus on these areas. I'll start defining what's a dream job. And some of you know that I love creating acrostic. So I created an acrostic for dream job. And then we'll talk about what do you do before interview? There's a three R, review your resume, how to create a winning resume, research the organization, the school that you're interested in, research the job or the field that you're interested in the three R. And the three P is, as Christian, I always start and end with prayer. 
So the prayer really give us wisdom, give us guidance, and then prepare and practice. Practice makes perfect. So we've talked a lot about what to prepare and practice for. Then we'll go into during the interview and later on after the interview, and then we'll offer some resources and next steps. So here's the dream job. Dream job is to D, do your homework, the research and the review that we talked about. And also the next four week class will help you to do the homework, to do some soul searching, to get to know yourself, very important. Whether it's the school or the company you want to go to, you need to know who you are, what you're interested in, how would that fit you the best? And how can you contribute the most? Oh, research the company, the industry that you're getting into, the university that you're interested in, the major that you want to study. E, exercise interview, the resume. We're gonna go into very specific on how to make a winning resume and be most confident for interviews. A, act out the stories, the um, elevator pitch. And we have source stories and example to share with you. People love to hear stories, real stories, examples to demonstrate your strength, not just preachy lectures, right? We want it to be uh, lively, good examples to show the qualities that they are looking for and your body language. And you can look at me and watch what I do right or wrong. Look at my body language and we'll go deep into how do you manage your body language? And finally, M, manage your timeline. The whole dream job process is like a project. So we need to be diligent to plan out your milestone, your goals, and your timeline from now to your end date. What do you need to do through this dream job and all the tools that we're going to talk about today? So in the three P, we start with prayer and we use the scripture to help us pray. And one of my favorite is Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And that's my experience in my 40 years as a Christian since I became a Christian in 1981. Whether it's when I study very intense competitive courses at Cornell and Princeton or working really hard and I'm a workaholic and taking care of my family and two children and very committed serving in my church. I learned to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And it's so true. God has granted me favors with good grades, good work and good family and just so thankful. And even in my retirement and in retirement, God has so much favor for me. So give God all the glory. Matthew 7, 7 is another very good prayer that we can uh, follow the scripture to pray on. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. This may be the only acrostic in the Bible. A-S-K. Ask. God is a God of a loving God and he loves to answer our prayers. When we pray, aligned to his will. So ask, seek, and knock, and he will always open the door. So let's go into reviewing our resume. How do you build an impressive resume? And what's the purpose of the resume? There are tons of resume HR manager directors will get every day. Admission office officers, they get hundreds and thousands of resume. So the idea is to have an impressive resume that would get their interest and their attention to get you an interview. Can you imagine looking at these statistics? Any HR manager, at least 25% of them would get 50, at least 50 resume for each job listing. Even some 10% of the HR manager can get over hundreds of resume. So guess how much time each HR manager or admission officer would spend on your resume. Very short time, very short time. You see five to 10 seconds, a quick glance. So one pager resume, your front page has to be very appealing and very interesting. 
If they're interested, they may spend longer, 25 to 30 seconds. If it looks really interesting, you have keywords that pop out, they may spend a minute and then they would go deeper. And hopefully you'll win and earn an interview. So we'll look at what's a winning resume. So what are the HR managers looking for? Relevant experience, 77% has to match the right skill. Specific accomplishment, 48%. You have a track record from the past that you demonstrated. These experience in a successful way, these strengths and these qualities that new job is looking for. 41% ask for um, resume that customized to the open position. And I'll show you example how to do that. So HR manager would look for keywords like these and also very specific keywords that are in the job description. So I always tell people, learn to customize your resume to include keywords like how good you're in problem solving, leadership, communication, team building, and being productive. And these are the basic minimum. It's not just the words, it's also the examples. So you should have in your resume accomplishment you've made. And we see examples of that, that really support these keywords and the job description keywords. So these days, year 2021, it's a lot more that companies are asking for. And as we know, we have AI, robots. So we don't want to just be doing work that AI and robot can replace us with. So we want to be unique. And these are the kind of skills that are needed and in demand 2020 and beyond. What the robots and AI couldn't do on their own. So we have to be creative in problem solving, coming up with out of the box thinking and solution, critical thinking, independent um, creative uh, thinking and people relationship. So that's a lot of emotional quotient, people management and collaboration. Definitely machine learning, AI and robots cannot replace us. And then in solving problems and being critical in our thought process and our thought leadership, we need to have good IQ. That's minimum, right? And being Asian that where most of us are, intelligent quotient is probably least of our worries. And then our AQ, adversity quotient, may not be as a great concern either because we are not afraid of challenges and we can solve problems. EQ is where we need to grow a lot in our leadership, in our relationship with people and in how we can influence others. So some basics on a winning resume, make it legible. So these are very basic, right? Consistent font, as you can see in my PowerPoint in a similar way and we show you examples of um, a resume. Um, I usually like Calibri. Uh, I think time, New Roman's a little bit busy. Arial's good too. And the font cannot be too small. Uh, 11 or 12 is very uh, acceptable. Too small is hard to read. Too big, it's unusual, right? And you probably run out of space. The format, make it very consistent. Uh, you see examples of that. And I have eagle eyes. So during my 33 years career, other than technical work, I also did a lot of marketing and business management. So I'm very picky. And a lot of times when I meet with my mentees, even young adults or older adults, seasoned adults, I can still see very um, picky areas that I can recommend for them to improve in their formats, in their um, way to represent the information. So make it relevant. Try to align your resume to the job description. And of course, it has to be real, has to be accurate. And then consider using some template and you see some example of those. What are the don'ts of a winning resume? So don't exceed five bullets per job. I often see resume that do have more than five bullets because that's too much. You have to consolidate. And be sure not to have any grammar or spelling errors. And I still see that when I meet with my mentees. And don't use funny or unusual email address. Try to be more professional and easy for people to remember. 
And for many of us who may have Chinese name, I recommend to use a, uh, a, a Christian name or American name, makes it easier for people to address you. And you can include that in your email address. And then uh, don't use multiple um, times of the same word, try to use different words. So for example, like organize, organizing, organize, try to um, change different word and also be consistent in the verb form. So for past tense, it's always ed. For things you're doing now would be organized. So sometimes I see a mix of that. So be consistent. And then um, no need to say reference available. That's understood. So that's a waste of space. Now format really matters because format is what gets people's attention when you first have the first few second glance on your resume. So we talked about all the font, the alignment, the grammar, all those are very important. So here are some examples. You can see that this has quite acceptable format, right? You see a very clear name and a brief summary of their qualification experience. And then you see each job is no more than five bullets. Now the one on the right did have more than five bullets. So you want to kind of reduce that. And yet overall, you see each bullet is no more than two lines. So it's okay to do two lines, but avoid three or more because you're not writing a book. And you can see all the bullets start with the action word. So no paragraphs, no I, me, him, them, no pronouns. So here's another example. So this mentee is very diligent trying to pack good information in it. Uh, it may get a little busy and yet you can still see the text and the bullets are consistent with the guidelines that I suggested. Uh, whether you want to do color or not, um, is not that important. I think the font, bold, italic, and regular helps to stand out some important points, just like the one on the right. The one on the right is very good example in the format. And then the exact wording of what you write, it's extremely important. And this will tie directly to your interview the words and the stories that you're gonna tell. So here are two very good examples. When you talk about your accomplishment, you start with the action word, and these action words should try to align to the job description if you're doing a customized resume. And these action words should demonstrate your strength, what exactly you did, and it has to have numbers. Look at both of these, have good numbers, whether it's dollar sign, percentage, number of people, number of weeks, number of um, duration. Numbers speak volume. Numbers help people to get a sense of exactly what you accomplish and how much did you accomplish. So look at these two examples, really give you a good um, taste of good accomplishment. And that's what you're gonna be using in your interview. Exceed the sales quota consistently by an average of 5% for three years through effective use of rebates for volume purchases. Powerful, clear, concise, and compelling. You don't need to go through a lot of detail what you did and all the grand detail, right? Only, they could ask you and you can share. Second example, achieved customer satisfaction of 98% by minimizing downtime to 0.03% during a two month systems conversion. Wow, really good example. So we have three types of resume to share with you. First is the very standard chronological resume that people will tell from the most recent where we are now, the job that you're working on to more back in the history. And then you share your education and additional skills. So this is very typical and standard. Again, you can watch the example of the bullets being very short and no more than five bullets per job. Second type of resume, it's a combination where it's combination of their skill, their professional profile and their chronological, starting from most recent kind of uh, descending order from most recent to the older. So here's an example. You start with the professional profile and what your skill, and then you blend into the relevant work experience, uh, somewhat of a chronological order. 
And again, you can see the example of no more than two lines per bullet and no more than, and in this case, there's uh, five bullets under each job. And you can see numbers and then your education. The third and probably the most uh, desirable and also the most work is the customized type resume where you are targeting to a particular job that you're really interested in. And I'm giving you quite a number of examples. You can either take screenshot or come back and listen again because the number of tools that we won't go into all the detail. So here is such a good example, a list of phrases with the right action word aligned to a HR human resource manager. What would the job description include for HR manager? Recruit, orientation, manage, administer. So these are good verbs that you can see from the job description and you can try to incorporate. And of course, you need to have done this work in order to incorporate in your resume. And these are the summary of professional qualifications. And this is where you demonstrate and you summarize your years of experience. And this is really get their most attention, whether they want to continue to read beyond the seconds. So experience manager with expertise in human relations and project management. And then identify the key skill and experience you have and put in adjective. Now, this person puts superb. I would be a little bit uh, cautious about um, somewhat of a exaggerated type of adjective. So I would say effective, written and oral communication. And you could even say it, my favorite is CCP, clear, concise, and compelling. And then through your resume, you better demonstrate clear, concise, and compelling, right? In your communication. And when you get into the professional experience for a targeted resume, again, think about keywords that this job is looking for and the key experience. And again, you got to have those experience in order to make them relevant. And then all the words highlighted in blue and you can see the numbers. And what's also very powerful is the comparison before and after. You see the numbers from 68% turnover of staff to 14%. That demonstrate your effective and successful performance as an HR manager. So compare before and after. And we'll have more examples and source stories later on. And here's uh, talking about the program director role. And again, you highlight the keywords, phrases that would get the attention of the hiring manager. And you see numbers, uh, ethnic diversity, increasing from 0% to 36% during a 10 year period. So think smart goal, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. When you put your accomplishment, that should answer those five questions. Clinical director. So from a clinical director perspective, what's important from that job description? Again, you put uh, those key phrases in and this person did not have as many of the numbers. So, we review our winning resume is the first R. Then now the next two hours are research the company and the people who are interviewing you. You can get to know them through LinkedIn. Uh, and also to research your job and the industry that you're applying. So these are some basic principles and ideas and tools. Obviously for company website, you can learn a lot about the history, the growth, the strategy. The company profile can also be available in many other websites like Hoover's, Dun & Bradstreet, Cranes, or Glassdoor. Look for the announcement, press releases on their website, very important because that's what's important to them. When I was in marketing and working with press uh, PR, public relations, the, it's all about really having a powerful, compelling press release to get the attention of the industry, their review and our customers. So be interested in what they're interested in, curious on what they work hard on, 
and then learn about the interviewers, their background. There could be some who went to the same school as you or similar hometown or a similar state, you know, ways to make connections. And of course, you don't want to appear like you're stalking them, right? So you want it to be natural and also understand what they may be interested in, in their role, in answering their question. You want to answer toward their area of expertise and toward what their role and their responsibility is. Read and reread your job description so you're very confident and familiar with it and know that you can fit and you have your strength and quality to match. And know what questions to ask. We'll give you many examples later on. What to ask, what not to ask. You want to ask related to the job. Avoid personal question and avoid just thinking about me, myself, and I. What's in it for me? Avoid those. Think about the company. Think about how you can contribute to help them to be successful. You also want to research the industry, the trend the challenges, and that way you can speak with intelligence and ask good questions. So here are some websites you can go uh, try, find different industry. And of course, the dress, it's minimum, and I don't need to spend too much time on it. You can easily find all types of dress code online. I want to focus on the tools and examples so that you can feel confident to interact and represent your personal brand in these interviews. So the next three Ps are prepare and practice. And we already cover pray. So these are examples of questions that they would ask you, whether on the phone or in person. And we suggest uh, if you're doing phone interview or Zoom interview, which we're going to go into more in detail later on, I suggest you would stand up like I am standing up, giving a talk. That way you're more free you have more energy, you're more natural. So these are examples of questions that you want to be prepared to, to answer. What, why are you interested? What do you want this, why do you want this job? What are the challenges you're looking for? So of course, again, you can easily find many questions online. So I want to focus on giving you examples of how to answer them. So here are some examples of behavioral questions. Tell me about a time and you can dot, 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 all kinds of behavioral questions. And we'll give you a long list of examples and how do we answer them? And I got those from working with mentees when I helped them with mock interview and specific example, how to answer them. So think about your own resume and your own experience, whether in high school, in college, or in your career. Think of these behaviors and actions what did you do? And how would all those demonstrate your strength? How about asking question? What questions do you need to prepare to ask? So talking to a hiring manager, you can ask these questions. Again, you can find these online. Uh, it's a little bit small to read. Uh, you can take a picture. They are very practical, um, relevant question to ask your hiring manager. And we'll have some to give you some more example later. And then when you meet with an HR or recruiter, then you have a different type of question you'll ask about the position, the organization and such, and the timing and the process. So now we're gonna go into during the interview. What are the goals of the interview for the interviewer and the interviewee yourself? And what are the types of interview? How do you prepare for them? And then during the interview, how do you communicate? So we're going to spend a lot of time on that. So for any interviewer and interviewee, in this very important meeting, our goal is very clear, right? For the interviewer, they want to find the right and the best candidate for the job or for the university. So they want to know, can this person do the job? Do they have the skill, abilities, and qualifications? So that has to do with our IQ and our AQ, right? Are you able to overcome challenges? Will you do the job? Are you willing to do the job, right? Do you have interest? Do you show interest? Do you have a good attitude and a motivation? And the third question is, 
how would you fit into the organization, into the school environment, into the student body? What's your personality teamwork? So I talked a lot about the soft skill, your emotional quotient, and be ready to tell a story that you have these three good answers. And then what is your goal as an interviewee? You want to impress the interviewer with your strength, of course, with substance, with the real deal, with good examples. So you want to learn what is the position, learn about a company, learn about the people. And would I fit uh, this organization? And would this job fit my career plan? You need to know your career plan. You need to know where do you want to go from here and for how long and what you want to do. So these are the typical seven qualities that the interviewers would be looking for. People with good aptitude, your ability, good attitude, your motivation, your affability, meaning good relationship. You, have, you come across as friendly, as easy to get along. You're available, you're committed, you're interested. That they can afford you. You're not asking for pie in the sky kind of a pay and benefits. And credibility, you need to come across absolutely truthful with what you share and show your compatibility with the team, with this company culture, with this school environment, with their values. So what are the types of interviews? So there are many different types. The one I did a lot myself are the informational interviews. Over my 33 years of career at work, I have done many informational interviews, both as an interviewer and more often also as an interviewee, where I get to know some mentors and leaders in our company over time that I would like to build meaningful relationship with them. So we'll talk more about it in the next four weeks class on how to network with people and what is networking and what is not networking. Networking isn't about asking people to help you find jobs. Networking is building meaningful, mutually beneficial relationship. So the informational interview will learn in the next few weeks, how do you represent yourself? How do you tell people who you are? And how do you seek their advice? The screening interview, sequential interview, stress interview to just really test if you can take charge, uh, performance interview to really show your skill, giving you some tests. Some will be over a meal. Uh, some may be out of town inviting you to come on site. So there, when you are in the interview, sometimes it could be a rotational and that's very popular. So you have a half day or full day schedule and taking turn to meet with one person at a time, one-on-one, -on -one, rotating. And then now more popular group interviews. Sometimes it could be a few candidates together meeting with the panel. And then they would observe how you interact with fellow candidates and your dynamics. Because right there and then they know your behavior. And you need to be very careful to be self-aware, watch, listen to yourself and others aware and watch and listen to others so that you can be tuned to the group interaction. And then there's the panel interview like this picture, multiple interviewers talking to one candidate. And sometimes it could be over 10, but that will be a little bit overwhelming. And then what you want to do is to make sure you know each of their role, take quick notes and remember their roles and try to address from their perspective. When you respond to a particular interviewer who asks you a question, you also want to have some eye contact with the others as well. And there's a lot to do with kind of your public speaking skill, which we'll cover a little bit later on. So sometimes may even ask you to build a presentation. So, more and more during pandemic, many interviews could be phone, especially the initial phone interview screening you to see if you can qualify for future follow-up. And then many times are doing Zoom. So my husband and I gave a talk, a one hour talk on Zoom. How do you maximize your presence over Zoom? Virtual presence. So I'll pull a few slides from there to help us with interview. So even though it's a phone and Zoom interview, there are 
it's important as the in-person interview. In fact, uh, important enough for you to win and earn your next stage, the next round of interview. So treat it as like a real interview, right? So make sure your place is very private and comfortable, well lit. The lighting is extremely important, you can see, and I'll show you examples later on as well. And be ready with um, uh, your resume, your notes to take. And good news is with the phone and Zoom interview, you actually could arrange to have another computer or some screen to show some of the uh, cheat sheet information that you may need. And hopefully you don't need too much because you don't wanna sound like reading or reciting. You want it to be natural. You want to be internalized so that you come through real, authentic, genuine. And then before the actual phone and Zoom interview, I always tell my mentees, in fact, when I do the mock interview with them, they would record the Zoom uh, meeting so they can watch and go back and listen to themselves, listen to what I suggest, and they would learn from that. That's how I learned public speaking. When I was in corporate America, I had various executive training and coaching. One of them is public speaking. So they would video record my presentation, my speaking to an audience, and then they would sit us down to watch it. And it's painful to watch yourself, but it's needed. So whether you're looking at the mirror or recording, looking at your whole body language and your tongue, and we'll dive more into it in a minute, and just be yourself, be natural, like we said. So typical interview structure. There's the pre-interview while you're waiting or signing in, greeting, introduction, make sure, be real, kind of talk about the weather, talk about how was your weekend, small talk. Don't just be uptight, always thinking about the job. Think of the people as people, as human being, making mutual um, good connection, a mutually beneficial conversation. Uh, information exchange. Throughout the interview, there are questions and answers, of course. Um, most likely, they will ask you many good questions, and you also want to be ready to ask some good questions as well. And then the closing. And what is the next step? So that's the typical structure. So in the pre-interview and the greeting, the moment you arrive, the moment you show up, or even before that, how you interact with them, they are watching you. They are judging you in your body language, in how you prepare and how you smile, how you take things out and get ready. Definitely arrive early so that you are composed in your mindset, in your uh, mood, in what you're prepared to answer, that you're natural and be ready to have friendly greeting. Always remember the interviewer's name as they email you, they got to tell you upfront who they are and such and know how to pronounce it, practice to make sure you get it right or ask people and be warm and very confident in your handshake. Practice your handshake, not too strong, not too soft, but firm and demonstrate your confidence and your assertiveness. And your first few words are gonna matter a lot. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for scheduling this time to meet. And then be polite, wait for them to tell you to go in or to sit down. And typical exchange includes some direct question, asking and confirming, can you do this job? Do you have these skills? Some are open-ended, like the many behavior questions that we're gonna look into. How, tell me about a time, describe a situation, give me an example. So you need to go in prepared and we'll give you a structure how to answer those with good compelling stories. And then some why question, is to better understand your preference and your motives. So here are some taboos. These are problems that could create a bad impression. When you're not tidy looking, you don't have the confidence to look at them, give them eye contact, or you have negative attitude, complain about some people or making excuses, oh, traffic, you're late, um, lack of interest of enthusiasm, lack of preparation. Uh, not 
being clear, concise, and compelling. These three are the most important principle in your communication, clear, concise, and compelling. And of course, has to be character-based as well. Definitely truthful and very complete. And then um, you're not giving concrete examples, so people find it very vague, and you didn't understand the job description and the role. Not willing to start at a lower level, if that's what may fit you better. And you may overemphasize too much on money, benefits, uh, vacation, and perks, or you don't have a career plan. So all these cause a very bad impression. The career plan, they will ask, what do you want to grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? So you need to know your career plan. And in our four-week class, we'll work on that together. So here are some do's and don'ts, right? Be sure to show your enthusiasm, confidence, being friendly, mature and professional. If you know you tend to be nervous with maybe some hand motion or fidgeting, be aware of those and avoid those. Again, be articulate, positive, and always demonstrate your strength. If you need a minute to pause, to think, you can ask for that and ask for permission. Don't get nervous. Or some, you may not even know the answer. Maybe you can come back to it later on. And sometimes if you see bias or stereotype, don't get offended. Don't take it personally. Respond with high emotional quotient. And my definition of high EQ is don't let others' words and action degrade your value and control your response. They are responsible for their stereotype and their bias. And what are the don'ts? Don't get negative, don't get nervous like these two people on the picture. As Asian American, perhaps it's difficult for us in our English communication. Be very watchful and careful. No ums and like, uh, yeah, I think. I always share with my mentees when I hear those. And when you record yourself, you know, less is more. Because these are filler words. These are annoying. These are distracting. You use these because you may be thinking. Maybe you're not sure. But you don't want to be telling them. You don't have to think out loud. You can pause. It's better to be silent. No ums like, yeah, I think. All those need to be cut out. No exaggeration. Don't lie, of course. Don't turn on your cell phone. Don't interrupt the interviewer. Don't get into a debate with them, even though you may not agree with them. Practice active listening and don't use ac acronym because acronym is very frustrating for people who may not know it and they will feel like, oh, I don't know that much, huh? You don't want to offend them. So you need to be thoughtful in your resume, in your interview to spell out the words, even though it may be obvious. So these are the top 10 tips that you can easily find online. And this one, my husband found for me, make yourself comfortable, firm handshake, straight posture. But when you're answering or and when you're sitting down, you can lean forward a bit. Always have good eye contact, smile, be natural. Don't be funny, smile when you shouldn't, right? And the fidgeting. So actually the, we were talking about T-Mobile, the former CEO of T-Mobile was my coworker. And he would like to fidget. And during meeting, he would use a rubber band or watch and he would fidget. So we need to be careful and find different ways to <clears throat> express your nervousness, maybe holding to a pencil or holding to a desk, uh, <clears throat> something to avoid fidgeting. Correct any hand movement that are important. And I'll show you pictures of what are the correct hand motions and show interest, lean forward, be polite, and always leave a positive note. So during the interview, it's so important to articulate and demonstrate effective communication. So I have many communication talks. Here, I just show a partial example of how to communicate with the A, B, C skills. Active listening, there's a whole art and science to active listening. How do you mirror what they say? Rephrase them. Acknowledge what they say with nods. Tune to what they're saying and paying attention, not just getting ready to answer the question. And ask good question or clarifying question. 
or help you with active listening. So what you're saying is, it's a good way to paraphrase what they just said. Did I get this right? Body language, we're gonna dive in more in a minute. And you see these little three cartoons. They're the three V we're gonna get into. There's the visual, it's 55% impact on the first impression. There's the voice, 38%. And there's the verbal, which we work so hard how to articulate. It's only 7% impact on your first impression. So we talk a lot about visual and voice, those body language. And then C is the character. When you say something positive and praise someone, don't just say, oh, wonderful, terrific. That's so empty. You could say, oh, thank you for being so considerate. Oh, thank you for being thoughtful, planning this agenda and the schedule. So put in some specific words and specific description. And James 1.9 remind us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And if you look at the Chinese character, you know, we listen not just with our ear, but with our heart, with our eyes, and also with great respect, treating that person like a king. So this really powerful, active listening. So the Meridian rule of communication is the 55, 38, and 7. We'll start with the first V, visual, the body language. Wow, 55%. We're going to talk about how to be successful with your body language. Then we'll get into the voice, the tone of your voice, 38%. Then we'll get into the actual words with the stories. And that's hard to exercise. And even that is only 7%. But we need to do well in all three areas. Body language, right? Look at these examples of pictures. These are good body language. And look at when I'm speaking, what is my body language? So positive posture, heads up. Open hands, don't ever do this or this or play with your hair, right? And you'll see some do's and don'ts. Sit straight, maintain good eye contact. Natural smile as appropriate. Use hand gesture as needed. I'm sure we don't do the ones on the right, right? Slouching, staring, frowning, fidgeting. So I came up with a smile. It's the first time I used this acrostic. I just came up with it for today. It's a good summary of a body language in an interview or in any general meeting. So you want to sit and stand with good posture, we just talked about, and mirror what they say in active listening, in their words, in their action. Not exactly be a copycat of every single thing, but try to mirror them. Impress them with your good and open posture. Relax, right? Instead of trying to rush or being very antsy or nervous. And lean forward when you're listening or answering questions to show your interest. And then your eye contact. So in general, in total, is the smile. And you can see examples of these pictures. So when you're in Zoom, how do you maximize your virtual presence? It's more difficult. There's some pros and cons, many cons. So what do we do? So here are some examples. Look at these ladies. While they're looking at the screen, they are still showing the body language, which is the facial expression, the hand motions to illustrate their enthusiasm and their involvement. If you watch interviews on TVs, recently I just saw Lisa Su's interview, the CEO of AMD very proud of her accomplishment on Bloomberg, on the interview. You can see her hands are always like that. You want hands up, you don't want hands down or pointing at someone. And you can see Preston Reagan as a very good example of public speaker. So these are research from Alan P showing the percentage of how people welcome this particular hand gesture. So 84% you want a hands up, just like this lady as an example or Angela Lee Duckworth. She's really good with TED Talk about her grit examples. So when we are in a Zoom interview, Zoom meeting, except if it's an all day, you try to stand. And like I mentioned, you can move more freely that way and you can um, express yourself with more energy. When you're sitting down, you're more stifled and not as comfortable. And then your next V. So we just talk about 
visual, body language. Second V is your voice. Especially with Zoom, your voice is so important because you don't have that in-person touch and feel. You want to use your voice to demonstrate your strength, your effective communication, your personal brand. So remember these three P, right? Your pitch, your pause, your pace, your volume, up and down, your projection so that people can hear you very well, that you'll come across very clear and that you can maximize your virtual presence. Here are some examples of very famous speakers. We all know Steve Jobs and Martin Luther King and Amy Tan. So think at the time when you should be slow to emphasize the importance or new ideas and when you need to be fast. In general, we don't want to be too fast, but if it's important or urgent and something that you really want to emphasize, you could be fast. Uh, in general, I would recommend more of a medium pace and it's good to pause at in between and then practice. Always practice makes perfect. Now we go into SOAR communication skill, which is the verbal part. So we cover the brief ABC and the visual, the voice, and now we go into the verbal. During the interview, how do you tell your story? All the time you know at interview, whether it's job or university interview, they always perhaps ask and start with, tell me about yourself. So I'm going to give you some ideas. How do you tell people about yourself? It sounds like a very dreaded question because this could be loaded. And I'll tell you, in general, your response to any question should not be longer than three minutes. In general, it should be a minute to two minutes. So you need to gauge yourself because it's a conversation. So you want it to be about two minutes. And for sore stories, I tell my mentees and students to be about a minute and you can time me and I'll give you some example. So tell me about yourself. This is a very important opening question. It seems very intimidating, but also first impression is very powerful. It's gonna last for quite some time. It set the tone of the interview. People get to know who you are. And this is an opportunity to provide a little bit deeper to your resume. Because obviously they have their resume, your resume. So don't repeat all the words in your resume. This is an opportunity to personalize your story, to tell them something may not be in the, as obvious in the resume, to get insights into who you are. This is an opportunity to tell them something that they may not know yet from the resume. And it's also an opportunity to show your strength, to connect to the position that you're looking for. This is not easy. So this is an interesting example. Again, you can find example when you search online, how to show, tell me yourself example. So this is a very creative one. And I'll just give you one and you can find others. Uh, in the past few years, I've gotten really interested in geocaching. I love the challenge of finding caches, where they are, where spending time outdoor with friends. I like using problem solving skills to find the ones that are well hidden. Learning how people hide things and where people are likely to look really helped me to tremendously grow my design experience and help my design work. It's all about learning to see things through other people's perspective. So this, tell me about yourself. It's a very creative approach to demonstrate that you have ability to learn from daily life experience and work as a team, and you even have an adventurous spirit. Another approach to answer, tell me about yourself, and this is very typical, is briefly talk about your past, your present, and your future. And many of my mentees will prepare this. And once you prepare this, don't just memorize it, but really make it natural and internalize it. Very briefly on your past, highlighting your background, Again, always thinking about demonstrating your strength related to your new job that you're looking for. So key experience from the past or education or volunteer and connecting to your current job. And then 
what your future plan may be. So very brief example. So now this is a very powerful tool that I hope everyone practice very seriously on sore stories. How do you tell people in a minute or two about your strength? And I always tell people to come up with at least three examples. So SOAR stands for situation, obstacle, action, and result. And many of you probably heard about STAR, situation, task, action, and result. I like obstacle because I believe our SOAR story is to help us to soar on wings like eagles, like in Isaiah 40 tells us, because your story should demonstrate how you solve problem, how you make a difference. What did you do? How did you do it? And how much did you accomplish? The numbers, right? Remember the numbers. So the three stories that I always tell people to get ready for, one is for intelligent quotient, one is for emotional quotient on relationship with people, one is on AQ adversity quotient, because these are the three key basic qualities that we look for when hiring employees or even for college application. Because you need to know how to solve problems and learn fast. So here's an example, and you can tie me. Here's an IQ example. I'm a fast learner. I enjoy learning new things and solving problems. One time, my professor asked us to use a new compiler tool that we've never learned before. Usually, it takes 13 week course to learn. I took the initiative to study online for three weeks and as expert. At the end, I learned the tool and I help our project team using this compiler tool. And we work on a project and we got an A. That's less than a minute. That's IQ. That's your ability to learn new things, solve problems, and already talk about helping others as a team. And you talk about the before and after. Usually 13 weeks. For you, your fast learner, three weeks and you ask expert. That's the before and after contrast. And then what's the result? You got an A, you help the team on the project. Here's one for EQ. I am a good team player. I enjoy working with others and help the team to be successful. One time I joined a new group and there's a coworker who seemed a little bit difficult to get along. She wouldn't usually greet people or respond when you talk to them her. I didn't give up. I continued to greet her and offer help when she needed. Then we became friends and we worked on a paper together and we got an award for the paper. So that's another example about a minute. So you get the idea. Stay the string, tell them about the situation, the obstacle, and you notice I use the word seem to be. You, want, you don't want to be a, too strong and negative. Seem to be. You want to be soft. And then what did you do? And then what's the result? So um, these are the eight cues on the course that I'm teaching now. And I uh, actually took a, taught a short version and a long version. And we're uh, learning the learn long version. And these are the eight cues that we always need for us to be successful leader. And the three cues that I just talked about are IQ, EQ, and then I'll give you an example on AQ. So these quotients are helping us to build relationship with God, relationship with ourselves, with others, and with things. So when you look at a competency-based interview, here are some examples of questions that they would ask you. They would ask to make sure your competency are real, are well-demonstrated in examples, in a source stories that you can tell them. For example, teamwork. So you can describe a time when you work with the project team. And I have a few examples later on to show you how to respond. Communication skill, interpersonal skill. How do you take responsibility and step up? How do you solve problems? So these are typical questions. So when you prepare your source stories, here are the things that you want to work on. First, understand the job description. Remember the keywords that they look for and key responsibilities. And then look at the project you've worked on from your resume. And your resume should already have those accomplishment 
statement that I showed you earlier. They are, in itself is like a sore story. And then go back to your performance review. You know, we all spend so much time writing our performance review. Don't waste them because you word them, articulated what you accomplished. In there, it should have what you did, how you did them, and how much did you accomplish. But now you want to elevate a pitch, a short version. So make a list of your professional accomplishment and should be already in your resume. And then use the SOAR approach to come up with the story. And be open and honest and practice and keep them under two minutes. So here's an example on AQ. I'm good at executing complex projects with excellence. Working with good team collaboration on time and on budget. One time, I took over a complex auditing project without proper handoff from the last owner. I was challenged to complete it in 14 business days instead of the usual two months. So I put together a cross-functional team. We established our team goal, clearly stated, and it's achievable. And we worked diligently with a focused effort. As a result, we finished in 10 business days, four days ahead of schedule. This is a real example for my mentee. Now, we ended up spending almost an hour understanding all the detail in the situation. You don't need to give them more detail than needed. We need it to be an elevator pitch like this. So here are more behavioral questions that you can take a snapshot on and you can find these online. I'm gonna give you examples of how to respond them now in the next few minutes to finish up. How do you resolve conflict in a project? So you always start with the opening statement to set the tone. And then you use the source story to answer them. You will say, oh, conflict is not always negative. Conflicts can be healthy. When handled properly, they can lead to better communication, growth, and change. One time when I was leading a project, I had two team members in the user experience design group who could not agree with each other's design. We only had one day to make the design decision to meet the first milestone. So I set up a meeting with both of them, try to understand their common ground, what they would agree on, list out the uh, disagreement and the reasons. I practice active listening skills to understand each of their perspective and aim for collaboration and win-win resolution. I encourage them to think out of the box and develop additional possible solutions and try to align them toward our project goal. At the end, we came up with a mutually acceptable solution and we moved the project forward without missing the timeline. This is a little bit longer than a minute, but it has a lot of content. Example of demonstrating conflict resolution, communication, and team building, really not easy. And yet, if this is exactly what happened to you, you could consider that example. Tell me a time when you simplify the process. You start with an opening statement. I'm process oriented. I always drive process optimization to improve efficiency. When I was working at ABC company, we had a few hundred monthly reports that needed daily and weekly updates. Some reports were updated manually or semi-automated. When the reports were manually updated, People could forget and have typos and errors. So I led the project to optimize the report generation process with full automation and quality testing. Since we did the automation, we saw a 10% error deduction and 5% faster time improvement. And the company resources were more efficiently used for better performance. So here's another example. So I'm not gonna go through each one of these, Many more of these are on my website. I'll show you where they are. What was the biggest or most challenging project you managed? Feel free to take a picture of that. And these are all real stories of my mentees and how we work very hard on those from a lot of detail into elevated pitch in the SOAR story. Can you tell me an example of how you communicate a failure to your team, manager and customer? That is often, uh, Frequently it happened. How would you do that? So take a picture of that. How do you motivate the project team? 
all the time we need to motivate others, whether you're a manager or you're a peer. So here's another really good example. And you manage a project as required, and yet your customer's not happy. How do you handle that? Another very good example. Uh, how do you deal with underperforming project team members? I actually am doing a communication series, and this is one of a very popular question. And how do you communicate in a way that's still professional and help them improve? So here's an example. So tell me about your weakness. This is the last one. Oftentimes people would ask, what are your strengths and what are your weakness? And you use the source story like I show you to tell them about your IQ, EQ and AQ, at least three source stories. And oftentimes they ask, what area are you growing in? Same approach, start with a sore open statement and then a sore story. Don't just tell them that you are uh, workaholic or you are demanding or perfectionist. You want to tell them in a way that you are aware of it and you're working and taking action and what progress are you making in improving this weakness. And some people say that, um, and I don't always align to this approach, but some people say that you may not um, tell them a weakness that are related to the job. And I think you want to be genuine and honest. And also um, most important is that you are taking action and being truthful to your um, weakness. And a lot of times the weakness could be overusing your strength, right? One, some of my weakness are demanding or perfectionist and being aware of them and learn how to draw a line and set boundary and not to put in more effort than needed. So you need to explain, and that's actually some positive, but you're overusing your strength, your positive, then it became a weakness. So here's an example. Again, you can find and indeed.com has many good resources on behavior interviews. So what are some questions to ask? So you want them to be thoughtful and relevant. And also don't ask obvious questions. If answers are already on their website, you want to build on what you learn from the website and ask intelligent questions that are not in the website. For example, question number three, I see the competitive high level product roadmap on the company website. Would you share specific future direction or product launch plan for the company? So ask questions related to the job description, go deeper with relevance and related to uh, the job, how to ensure that you can be success successful to contribute to the job. So here's a reflection from one of my students that how she worked so hard on these source stories and how she did walk up interview with me and how during these two months, she was much less nervous, more well-prepared. In fact, at the end, she got two job offers. And then through some tools that we learned, like what we'll share in the next four weeks, it helped her to decide which job to use. So practice makes perfect. So at the end, to close, uh, you thank them for their time. And again, restate your interests and your strength in appropriate way, and then determine how to do follow up with them. Uh, so after the interview, I'm gonna have to go faster. Of course, you need to thank them. Uh, write a thank you note for each of the interviewer within 48 hours. And I'll show you an example. Remember the conversation you had and rephrase some of them and repeat them. Acknowledge the advice or good question they asked. Ultimately is to impress upon them your personal brand of active listening, your strength and your capability and your interest in the position. And then think about uh, how you did well and what can you improve on. Don't beat yourself up. You can always improve better. And then you take notes for future improvement in the next round. Hopefully you get future interview or you, if you do get a rejection letter, that's okay. We learn from mistakes. Hopefully you don't make the same mistake over and over again. And then um, sometimes they offer to give you feedback and ask in a professional and a polite way. That way you can learn and still keep relationship, right? Don't burn any bridges. So here's a thank you note example after the interview. Dear so-and-so, how you enjoy the time and repeat um, the 
requirement of the job in a very clear and concise way and how you're interested and how you can help uh, this uh, to contribute to this project and to this organization and then provide your contact information, make it easy for them to follow up with them. And congratulations, if you get the job offer, then you still need to manage that very well, right? When you receive it either in person on the phone or by postal mail, receiving a package or an email to, um, of course, expect the job offer to be in writing. And I help, help people how if appropriate, if there are times to negotiate the salary. Usually we err on the side not to, unless you really find the rationale to do so. And um, also be ready to get on board it and set a positive uh, tone to start the new job. So congratulations. So again, Indeed has a good summary of these 10 tips, uh, really including what we just talked about. And that's a good uh, example that you can capture. So in closing, I want to give you another verse from the Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. So however skill that we learn, always know to seek the Lord. And Jeremiah 29 also tell us the plan he has for us is not to harm us, but is to prosper us and to give us a hope and a future. So we need to seek him with all our heart. So just uh, some resources. If you use WeChat, you can take a picture of that. It's our website called to work and I'll show you where some of the interview uh, tips and examples are. Uh, you can join LINE, WeChat or WhatsApp. And in the WeChat group, we offer various resources and talks. And uh, on this uh, website, in the Encourage tab, under Elaine Kung, my name, you see many video uh, uh, recording on communication. Many of these are in English. Some are in Chinese being posted. Like this one is a whole 13-week series on in-depth call to work, the 5W and how to work. So it's all free, available. You can go watch it. And we also offer these with small group uh, discussion and also one-on-one -on -one if you finish the homework in these uh, series. So number five and number six are where more of these um, examples are. So you can go uh, listen to them and take time. So the next step, hope you would join us next four weeks, August 7th through 28th at the same time on Saturday as a family or as young adult to learn how to define your career footprint. And I would now give the time to Alan. Oh, two more um, opportunity. We do have a every Sunday's parenting class that we would um, use Mandarin. So you're welcome to join us. Tomorrow is about marriage relationship. And then I'm also giving another talk tomorrow in Mandarin on how to balance your time, your family, your work, and your life. And the last one, the youth. We have a youth camp on Zoom. We have every Saturday morning, this morning, we just did one with students from all over, 45 minutes. There are three of us, uh, a pastor, a doctor, uh, to talk about uh, helping them find purpose and um, helping them do service projects and grow. So I'll give the time to Alan and to you for any Q&A. Oh, yes. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of inf information. I'm glad that uh, I'm learning at the same time. I've been working with Elaine for a year. I learned so much from her, no matter what language she speaks and uh, her heart and also her kind of resources, which is just pull a lot of her mind. It's just come to me. So I just feel I'm the one who got to blast the most because I will listen to her firsthand. And we do have a couple of questions here. So okay. the first one is, are there any verbs you suggest us to avoid, like help or helped or work or worked? Do you have any suggestions to what's the word, words that we should not use or to frequently use to avoid some kind of too tedious uh, information, kind of bore the interviewers? Yeah, like help would be, something I would avoid, I usually would do deliver, develop, designed, implemented, assisted, 
led, managed. Okay. Do you, can you just uh, say that again so everybody could listen and remember? Maybe take notes too? Sure. Uh, so example of verbs you use, and you saw those from exam uh, resume I showed you earlier. Implemented, delivered, designed, developed, led, managed, or some examples. Organized, and also again, look at the job description you're applying to, and they have many good words that you can consider. Okay, so everybody hears her and uh, try to remember that and uh, use that frequently. So you not only listen once or twice, but you remember it and that turned to be your part of life. Uh, next question, uh, which is something I'm not quite understand, but I'll try to say that to everyone. Here it says, how do we make essentially stalking uh, the interviewer seem natural. So that's oh, okay. I think they mentioned, they meant uh, LinkedIn stalking, where you get to know the interviewer. Yeah, I think that's what they meant. As okay. you, I mentioned earlier, try to get to know the interviewer as you look at the LinkedIn profile and get to know their interest. So you want to know the information without volunteering it so explicitly so that you're more prepared to use what you know in a natural way. Okay, great. Uh, and then next common questions, I think I can reply everyone's that they are asking for the slides of this seminar and I told them that this is a kind of copyright related. We will not share the slides to everyone, but everyone is welcomed to watch the replay on YouTube channel and find the, uh, go to YouTube and uh, type in C-C-I-U-S-A. I type it on the chat. Then you'll find a lot of replay videos and including this one from next week. So you've got all of that. And next thing that I think some of our students are asking about the next week's class information. I'm going to okay. share this one now so everybody will see Good. it and uh, take a screenshot or register okay here it is let me just play that slide okay here it is it's uh your create for print revamp and refine and uh, we are still open for restoration and also the same time as this week and that this is a course for parent or parents with child or children. We already have 20 families registered and we still have some room, limited room available and scan this barcode to register and it's a paid course. So you need to scan it, register all the information and come to the class. The Zoom information is not the same as this one. So you will learn more in detail. And also this is more, there are two, we have two goals. One goal is that help your children to develop their career mind. And then another is, is very good family time that the parents and the children stay together. And we will also have small groups. Two families will share their experience and also learn from the course. They have their, everybody have, will have their own create course and especially for the young generation they are growing they are learning they are developing so it's their time to set up their goals and also elaine you know is a very good role model and example for us and we all as adults can learn from her too so take pictures for now and we'll replay that after this seminar and uh, you'll see that again let me see here's some other questions let me take a look uh for we will have more and uh, here ask about kind of courses. Uh, here we, I can say that we will have another course, which is in Mandarin. Let, let me just uh, change this slide. Okay, here's the Mandarin one. Everybody see it? That will be uh, started in December, uh, in October. And you will have all the dates and also we have public and also private lessons. We'll have a lot of small groups, small group leaders and uh, you will walk with a group of people and uh, learn from each other, encourage each other, and with, you know, Elaine taking the lead, and so we all grow together. 
So that's the course we'll have. And from next year, we didn't really release that yet. We will have all our courses in English. So as a international people, English is not our native language, but we have to use this language in our working environment. That's very important for all of us. So practice it, listen more to it and use it. That's why we will set up new course next year. It's English only course. So encourage everyone to just focus and look at all the web, web page or promotions of CCIUS and also call to work. So you will get all the information very soon. And here- Ellen, I see a few questions I oh, could address okay, them. Here, yes. One question is about the weakness and that is definitely a good idea. You can honestly talk about your weakness like I mentioned earlier, perfectionist, demanding, and yet when you say that in a sore approach and how it actually did show that you are a high performing person, high quality, it's actually a strength, but you're overusing your strength, then it becomes a weakness. So I would say like this as an example, I tend to be demanding and expecting a higher uh, performance than other people. So would be perfectionist. And I am working on setting the right boundary so that I know not to over invest or over expect others when the return is not uh, worth it and while building good relationship. So that's an example of a weakness that we know it's overusing of a strength and how you're aware of it and how you're setting boundary improving it and working toward better relationship. Because when you're demanding and perfectionists tend to give people pressure. So here's an example. The other question about this four week course in Mandarin. So we've taught this a few times. And actually, uh, Alan, uh, we're gonna offer the Mandarin next year with the video replay and small group and one-on-one -on -one with me. So we haven't announced it yet, but stay tuned. Right, Alan? Yes, exactly. We will also have the Mandarin course, which will be video replay, but we do have small groups. We'll have small group leaders, and also Yiling will get involved too. We will have kind of monthly gathering. So everybody will have some questions and bring to her. So she will share her questions, also her life experience. There's more pressures than only what we can see on the text and also on the video, because we want it to be more personal, more related to our, our daily life. There's a question, how I converted from a non-believer to a believer. <laughs> I'll give you a one minute version. I have often share my uh, testimony in many different settings like uh, 幸福小组, uh, 名人讲座. So some are on YouTube, I can uh, share. If you join our WeChat group for the call to work and I can share that. If you're interested, you can make the request on the group. So. I was a troublemaker. I always only believe in myself because my family is so poor. And coming from Hong Kong, I think everything is so small. It's like a frog inside a well. Until I came to America, when my friends in Hong Kong and the Christian friends in Hong Kong pray for me, and I really started to learn about this God who created the universe. And I love to study science. And from learning so much about the famous scientists like Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, and uh, Pascal, they are all Christians, including my Princeton professor, Dan Tui. He's a Nobel Prize winner. He's a Christian. So that really opened my eyes. And then I heard this phrase from the very famous scientist, Pascal. He said, in every person's heart, there's a vacuum. And this vacuum cannot be filled by money, degrees, riches, love, and family, and things. It's in the shape of God, and only God can fill. So that really got me to think. And Pascal is not just a scientist. He's also a mathematician, a theologian, and a philosopher. Wow. So I then learned to read the Bible in the right way, and then I realized how I was a sinner. I did wrong things. So I went through my ABC decision. I acknowledged that I did not meet God's standard. I believe 
that God loves me and created me and gave me a purpose. And C is I call on Jesus as son of God who died on the cross for me and rose again in three days. So that's a short version. There's a long version. But at the end, as you heard, I was a troublemaker before and God changed me to a peacemaker and my life is never the same. And I wish I knew God sooner. So that was 1981, 41 years ago. And all that I learned from school, for work, for my family, all that is really based on my faith and pr biblical principles. So yet very practical. So yeah, join these groups and ask what you need and I will send it to the group. Okay, any other question, Ellen? Yeah, I didn't see much and uh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And and uh, thing is the time for us to close this seminar. And I know that uh, we'll have next week and welcome everyone to join us next week to register and you receive all the information two, three days before the class starts. And uh, other than that, I hope everyone has learned ABC, learn a smile, learn a sore, and eight cues. There are a lot of words to learn. And uh, just uh, go go to the YouTube channel and find CJOC. You will receive all the information and uh, follow us on you know YouTube, Facebook, website, and everything. And uh, now let's close it with a prayer.